A Rebel's Journey, My Path to Liberty, written and narrated by Daryl W. Perry. Introduction. It all began on a Tuesday morning in February 1978, Chinese New Year, the year of the horse. It was also the day I was born, born to a 21-year-old father who was working as a manager at Shoney's and a 19-year-old mother who had dropped out of high school after she became pregnant with my brother. It was nearly three decades later that I would learn my journey did not begin on that Tuesday morning. It did not begin months earlier when I was conceived. My journey began several hundred years ago. My journey began when William Swinhoe decided to board a ship with his family, leave his home in England, and settle in Jamestown. When William's great-grandchildren fought in the French and Indian War and their children fought in the American Revolution, my journey was continuing. When my distant cousin James Madison was writing the Constitution of these United States of America, my journey was continuing. My journey continued as my ancestors fought to defend their new country from the British during the War of 1812 and continued as my great-great-great-grandfather father John Henry Myers joined the 10th Alabama Cavalry and fought to protect his land from invasion. My journey is not my own. Rather, my journey belongs to everyone, past, present, and future, that has had courage to stand up for what they feel is right in the face of oppression and perceived wrongdoing. My journey is a rebel's journey. What happened after being born on that Tuesday morning is partly clouded in mystery. According to one of my parents, I spent the next several months in the hospital due to being born prematurely. However, according to one of my grandmothers, that was not the case. I was simply dealing with a bout of jaundice. Whether or not I spent much, if any time in a hospital after birth is irrelevant. What mattered is that I had a family that loved me and wanted the best for me. Or so it seemed. Before I turned two, my parents had divorced, and I, along with my brother, spent the next few years bouncing between parents and grandparents from both sides of the family before landing in my father's custody. I have no memory of this or much of anything before I was four or five years old, though growing up, my memo, that's a southern term for grandmother, would often tell about the time I was standing on a chair at the kitchen table as she was cooking something she did often and very well. She has the ability to recite any recipe from memory at the drop of a hat. She turned to me and said, Now, you sit down before you fall out of that chair and crack your head wide open. As I sat down, I fell out of the chair and cracked my head open on an exposed door hinge. She picked me up and called the doctor to have him meet us at his office, something that was not uncommon in the early 1980s. As he was stitching up my head, I'm told I looked up and saw some of my blood on my grandmother's chin and said, Mamo, you got blood on your chin. The doctor and Mamo had a bit of a laugh as the doctor replied, Poor child's bleeding half to death and he's worried about his Mamo. I'm also told that around the same age I told her, Mamo, one day I'm going to buy you a red Cadillac. Though how or why I made that promise at a young age is still a mystery to me. I still intend on being able to buy her that red Cadillac one day. Among my first memories, I recall my father making slushies in a blender using ice cubes and Kool-Aid. My brother and I would then take them to the neighbors in the apartment complex. When the weather would get warmer, we'd have water balloon fights or swim in the pool. As I couldn't yet swim, I had a Bugs Bunny floaty that I used to hold me up. I remember one day sliding out of the floaty and sinking to the bottom of the pool. I can still see in my memory, as clear as a picture, looking down on myself from above as my body sank deeper into the pool. I rose higher into the sky. I watched myself being pulled out of the pool and revived. Many years later, I asked my father about this. Did it really happen or did I dream that it happened? He was surprised that I knew about this incident. He knew that he'd never told me this story and neither had my brother. He asked me how I knew about it and told me to never mention it again. Not long afterwards, it could have been weeks or even months, I'm not quite sure, we moved from that apartment into a small two-bedroom house in the East Lake neighborhood of Birmingham, Alabama. The first day in our new house, the power wasn't working. My father had my brother and me ask the neighbors if their power was working so that he could determine if there was a local outage or the power company had simply forgotten to turn on the power. I don't remember whether or not they had power. However, I do remember being given some fresh baked cookies. Over the next few months, the next door neighbor had introduced my father to his sister, a lovely woman that wanted children and was unable to have any of her own. My father joked that she only married him because of me and my brother. Judy was an amazing woman. Though she did not give birth to me, because of her love and devotion to my brother and me, she was mom. 
While living in Eastlake, my father, who quit a job working for the Alabama Department of Transportation to work for himself, operated a concession stand at a local park, selling drinks, snacks, and renting out paddle boats. He was truly a small business owner. Unable to hire people to work for him, Judy, my brother, and I were his employees. I learned to count before entering school by helping run that concession stand. I couldn't do much, though I was able to sit on a stool at the window and count change. That would never be allowed today because governments have placed so many regulations on both child labor and food safety. The horrors of a five-year-old child counting change and handing someone a bag of chips. For the next several years, we continued selling snacks, drinks, and renting paddle boats at Eastlake Park. My father's concession business even expanded to the local YMCA, selling snacks at the Youth League soccer games. My brother loved playing soccer. I did not, though I was signed up for a team anyways. I always played defense, which meant I stood in a small little area near the goalie box and didn't do anything until the ball was kicked in my general direction. If you've ever seen a youth soccer game, you know that most of the time, everyone except the goalies and one or two players on defense are huddled in a small area chasing the soccer ball and the ball rarely leaves that small mass of children. You can now hopefully understand my boredom of the game. I found basketball and BMX racing to be much more fun. Of course, that was before BMX was on ESPN. It was essentially racing a bike on a dirt course with a couple of hills, nothing fancy, though I always had fun. Another fun childhood memory involved football. My great-grandmother lived only one block from Legion Field in Birmingham. For many years, both major colleges in the state, Alabama and Auburn, played their home games in that stadium, though Auburn would also play games at their on-campus stadium, Jordan-Hare. Legion Field was also the home stadium for the Birmingham Stallions of the USFL, a league that was supposed to rival the NFL and in some ways did. Almost every Saturday during the fall was spent at Grandmother Hamilton's house parking cars. I'd stand on the street corner waving either my hand, a towel, or pom-pom directing cars either to the driveway behind or beside another car. Five dollars! Parking is only five dollars! I'd shout at the cars driving down the street. For as far as you could see in any direction, people were parking cars in their yards. Everyone charged the same to park, though not everyone would actually watch the cars to ensure they weren't broken into. We did, and no one ever had a car broken into or a tire slashed at Grandmother Hamilton's house. We had several families that were regular customers. They always arrived at the same time and parked in the same place. As a child, there are certain things you don't realize until years later. I never realized that my great-grandmother and the neighbor that lived across the alley were the only two white people that lived in that neighborhood. I didn't realize that just a few blocks away was one of the most dangerous projects in the city. As a child, I knew all of the neighbors and played with their children. I didn't care that their skin was darker than mine. After I was old enough to drive, my brother was in college, and my father was no longer helping park cars, I was able to do the job myself. One day in particular, the University of Alabama had played an early game, the last car had left, and I was standing in the alley talking to the neighbor when a police officer on horse rode up to us and said, It's getting late. This neighborhood's pretty bad. You might want to think about leaving now. I didn't think even for a second and replied, My grandmother lives in this house, pointing back to her house. She lives in this house, pointing at hers. I come out here almost every week. I know this neighborhood and I've never had a problem. With that reply, he rode away. Today, a reply of that sort would likely end with me being pepper sprayed, tape or arrested, or any combination of the three. This was not my first time to question authority. I've never been the type of person to accept because I said so as a valid answer. When I was a teenager and attended church regularly, I would often question the Sunday school teachers about why certain things are different now than they were. The Church of Christ, where my dad's parents went to church, would not play musical instruments while singing hymns. I remember asking a Sunday school teacher about this and mentioned that angels played trumpets, David played played a liar, and there are other references to people playing drums and cymbals. Her response, you don't put jelly on the communion bread. Other church leaders would often talk about the need to support traditional values, but would never go into detail about those values. I've always been curious about the hows and whys and have always sought the truth. It was this quest for truth and a definition of traditional values that has led me to where I am today and drives my journey. As a talk show host, one of the questions I like to ask my guest is, how did you come to the ideas of liberty? 
I've come to realize that there is very rarely ever one specific thing or event that people can pinpoint as the beginning of their path towards liberty. The same is true of me. As a child, I remember my father teaching me to question what I believed. I recall an instance in which he had several paddle boats in the front yard of our suburban home, and a neighbor called the cops to report a zoning violation. I knew something wasn't right when people could call the cops for someone having a boat in their yard. Of course, this was two and a half decades ago, well before people were being arrested for having gardens instead of grass. It wasn't long after this incident that my father decided to run for city council. During his campaign, he, my brother, and I walked neighborhoods knocking on doors, handing out business cards. I don't remember any part of my father's platform or the exact results other than the fact that he lost the election, but I do remember a valuable lesson. If you don't like the way things are, try to change them. Several years later, when I was in junior high and high school, I remember learning about how the government works, or at least the watered-down version they taught us in school in the 1990s. I learned a watered-down version of American history from 1776 to 1791, and all of the excuses given for why a powerful central government was needed to replace the Articles of Confederation. The 1992 presidential election was during my freshman year. I remember being really excited about Ross Perot's candidacy. He made sense and was a businessman. At the time, as the national debt was approaching $4 trillion, I thought that's what the country needed. I recall being one of the few people in my history class where these ideas were actually discussed to support Perot. Few in the class supported Clinton, with most of the class supporting Bush. There were eight candidates on the ballot in Alabama. Bush, Clinton, Perot, Andrew Moreau, Lenore Filani, James Warren, Lyndon LaRouche, and John Hagelin. We weren't even informed that any of these other candidates were running. During my junior and senior years of high school, I was on the debate team and learned to examine issues from both sides. It was during this time that I learned that there were multiple sides to the issues. I began to see things with an open mind and began researching the history of laws as they existed at the time. Even though I was not ideologically a libertarian when I graduated high school, I was on my way. It was during my college years that I first learned the real history of the war on drugs. There was no FDA until the early 1900s. Cannabis, cocaine, and many other drugs could be ordered from the Sears catalog, but drug abuse was not any more prevalent than it is today. The war on drugs began because of yellow journalism and racism. I remember asking myself, if I was lied to about the drug war, what else have I been told that was a lie? Around the same time, while attending church in the late 90s, I remember one of the deacons saying that we need to have a government that supports traditional values, though he was unable to explain in detail what he meant. I decided to find out what traditional values actually were. It was a long process, but it was a process well worth the effort that led me down the path from conservative to conservative libertarian to constitutionalist to constitutionalist libertarian to voluntarist, and can be summed up thus. Traditionally, individuals have generally had the right to do as they wish as long as they do not cause unjust harm to another person. I know there are many examples throughout history that show that this has not always been the case. Those are the exceptions that prove the rule. Further, this is a general rule, and I will show examples of many of the issues in which this has generally been the case. As you join me on this Rebel's Journey.